It's Thursday, February 20th, 2014. Clerk, if you'll call a roll, please. Councillor McCormick? Here. Councillor Camardo? Here. Councillor Cuddy? Here. Councillor Rusica? Here. Mayor Quill? Here. Please join me to pledge of allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And you remain standing for a moment of silent prayer reflection. Thank you. Please be seated. We will start out with our public to be heard. And clerk, if you could read our rules and regulations. At this time, we will open the public to be heard portion of the council meeting. As a reminder and pursuant to city council rules of procedure, Prior to addressing council, speakers are asked to state their name, address, and any affiliation. All comments should be addressed to the entire council and not to individual staff members. <clears throat> Your remarks must be limited to three minutes and concern only issues involving the city council, city government, or matters of general city concern. Issues involving specific employees of the city should be directed to the city manager outside of the meeting, and all speakers before council will observe commonly accepted rules of courtesy, personal attacks or abusive language will be ruled out of order. Thank you. At this time, is there anyone desiring to be heard? Mr. Gayback, please. Hi, Tom Gayback, 106 North Lewis Street. Tonight I'm here as your uh, sewer water supervisor for the city of Auburn. Just wanna piggyback on Mayor Miner's comments about infrastructure in the city of Syracuse. It's very, very important. That's what keeps a city going uh, forward in the right direction and brings in businesses. Uh, with sewage backups and lack of water, we're not gonna be very attractive to anyone. Um, I did wanna say, currently we have 108 miles of water mains in the city, and today through uh, the 20th of February, we've had 11 main breaks and six water ser services uh, erupt in the road. So we've, been, we've had a very busy month and a half. Um, infra infrastructure is very, very important. Um, we have been addressing some of our larger sewer mains down on Division Street and York Street all the way to the treatment plant. And now we're in the process of doing Franklin Street water main, which was desperately needed. I hope we come up with a plan to branch out farther into the neighborhoods. Pick a street, um, whether it's the one with most frequent water breaks or the, with the older, oldest water services and just tackle it with new sewer, new water main, and new services to the house. It would, it's desperately needed. So we're doing big things in the right direction. I'm very blessed and thankful for what we have been doing. Just wanna, hopefully we keep it going. So thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Gerger. Is there anyone else desiring to be heard this evening? No one? Very well, we'll close the public to be heard portion of our meeting. Move along to the approval of the meeting minutes from February 13th, 2014. We have a sponsor, Councilor Camardo, second by Councilor McCormick. Discussion? Clerk, if you call the roll, please. Motion to approve the minutes of Thursday, February 13th, 2014, City Council meeting. Councilor McCormick? Aye. Councilor Camardo? Yes. Councilor Cuddy? Yes. Councilor Rusica? Yes. <clears throat> Carried. Council, with your permission, we're gonna take a little, uh, things a little bit out of order tonight. What we have next is a combination proclamation resolution naming the city of Auburn along with Cambridge, Maryland, and St. Catharines, Ontario as sister cities. So at this point, do we have a sponsor? Councilor McCormick, second by Councilor Camargo. I also have this, remember. Okay. Want me to read the resolution first? Please, if you read sure. the resolution first. Council resolution bounding sister cities for the legacy of Harriet Tubman. Whereas Harriet Ross Tubman was born a slave in 1820 near the city of Cambridge in Dorchester County, Maryland, and whereas in 1849, Dorchester County is the place where Harriet Ross Tubman first escaped the cruelty of slavery and the place where she returned on many perilous trips 
to free others ensnared by the bondage of slavery. And whereas because the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850 required northern states to assist in capturing escaped slaves, Harriet Ross Tubman guided her flock across the northern border of the United States to St. Catharines, Ontario, Canada. And whereas Harriet Ross Tubman purchased a tract of land for her family home and spent her later years in Auburn, New York, where she died on March 10, 1913, and was buried with military honors at Fort Hill Cemetery in Auburn, New York. And whereas Harriet Ross Tubman's ex extraordinary life has created a unique link between Cambridge, Maryland, St. Catharines, Ontario, Canada, and Auburn, New York. Now therefore be it resolved that the municipalities of Cambridge, Maryland, St. Catharines, Ontario, Canada, and Auburn, New York be forever bonded as sister cities to commemorate and celebrate the life and legacy of Harriet Ross Tubman. Uh, clerk, Mr. Clerk, if you would, there's also a letter from uh, Cambridge, Maryland. If you just read that into the record, please. Sure, Mayor. From the office of the Mayor, City of Cambridge, Maryland. Dear Mayor Quill, as the Mayor of Cambridge, Maryland, and on behalf of the outstanding City of Cambridge Commissioners and every man, woman, and child in our fair city, it is my honor and pleasure to offer sincere greetings to the Council and citizens of Auburn, New York. We are unique as we have the honor of sharing in the life and legacy of Harriet Tubman. We are indeed honored to be considered sister cities with Auburn, New York and St. Catharines, Ontario. The city of Cambridge supports the sister city proclamation you will authorize on Thursday, <coughs> February 20th, 2014. Our council will authorize a companion proclamation on February 25th, 2014. As was stated by Brian McMullen of St. Catharines, who's the mayor of St. Catharines, we now have a special bond that will forever link us in celebration to the legacy and life of Harriet Tubman. Our very best wishes, Victoria Jackson Stanley, Mayor of the City of Cambridge, Maryland. Thank you. Discussion, Council? Council Cuddy, please. I just wanted to uh, say that I'm uh, very glad that, that uh, all three cities have uh, decided to have this memorialization. Um, I just uh, also today I, I went on the St. Catharines uh, newspaper and there was uh, there was a poll that uh, asked the people that live at St. Catharines um, how many people would travel to Auburn to uh, to uh, visit Harriet Tubman's hometown and there were 30 uh, 30 percent said they would and then another part of the poll said how many would travel further to uh, to uh, uh, Cambridge, and uh, there was another, you know, 30%. So that's 60% of people from St. Catharines would go and visit the other sites, the other uh, sister cities. So, um, and that really resonates with uh, what the city, a lot of what the city has to offer as as history's hometown, and and I think that proclamations like this. Um, that embrace the memory of Harriet Tubman and her legacy um, help us with our identity as history's hometown. So I, I, I just wanted to, um, you know, thank uh, you for for spearheading this, and I'm glad that uh, we are now um, officially bonded with these uh, cities. Um, and I I just want to continue to encourage uh, recognition and more more memorialization for a great American hero uh, who chose to make Auburn her hometown. So I just wanted to, uh, I'm glad that we're doing this. Thank you, Council. Anyone else? Council McCormick? Uh, I wanted to thank the Harriet Tubman Boosters Club. I think that's the Laurel, um, Juliet, and the, the group, in, and um, the Carter family as well. Um, and the, my time here at City Hall, 13 years, um, we've, we've honored Harriet on certain occasions, but I think it's been so long coming that we've recognized um, Harriet Tubman for the hero that she was and the role model that she can be to the the more kids that learn about her her legacy and the the strength and the courage that she had the better so I don't think we can do this enough and it's great that we're going to be able to um, join with the other cities that traveled that the Underground Railroad took her through so I'm really happy to be on City Council when we're honoring somebody like Harriet Tubman Anyone else? Just a, just a little background from my end. I uh, first met Mayor Jackson from Cambridge in Washington a few years ago when uh, some of us in the room were in Washington lobbying for the Harriet Tubman uh, historical site. Uh, she was a lovely lady, 
enjoy talking with her. She was to go home that she went home that weekend and uh, facing re-election, so she had her hands full. Communicate quite often with her. She's a great lady, as I said. And then the mayor from Cambridge, or excuse me, from uh, St. Catharines, Ontario, was here in Auburn last summer, about a year ago. Uh, we had a small meeting in the, in the mayor's office, and uh, after that, uh, Reverend Carter was here with us and myself took him on a tour of the city and shown him some highlights. And uh, he was very uh, pleased to find out a lot about Auburn. He knew about Auburn, but he didn't know a lot about it. So it was a great, great time. And uh, the three mayors have been working on this to try to get it together. Hopefully this will uh, work its way down to Washington also, that we do need this national park. And uh, maybe this will be a little more impetus for it to get it moving, so. No other discussion? Clerk, if you'll call the roll, please. Councilor McCormick? Aye. Councilor Camardo? Yes. Councilor Cuddy? Yes. Councilor Rasika? Yes. Aye. I'd ask, Reverend, I'd ask Reverend Carter if you meet me at the rail so we'll present this to him. Thank you, Mayor Quill, Council, and all members involved. On behalf of Bishop Dennis V. Proctor and the board of the Harriet Tubman Home, Inc., and Karen V. Hill, the president and CEO of the Harriet Tubman Home, and my wife, Christine, and myself, and all of those associated with the Harriet Tubman Home, we thank you. I do remember uh, almost a year ago when we had the mayor from St. Catharines here and took him around. We were hoping that this would be a joint venture that everybody would want to participate in. At that time, it was just a work in progress. But I think it's another thread in the tapestry of Harriet Tubman's life, which is already a great picture in itself. And I'm sure that this will give some momentum and some impetus to the things going on in the D.C. area, and hopefully it will help them to make a decision this year that Harriet Tubman needs to have this National Historic Park named in her honor uh, before any more time goes by. It's been on the table and off the table, but on behalf of all of those associated with the Harriet Tubman Home and the African Methodist Episcopal Zion Church, we thank you for joining with Cambridge and the city of St. Catharines, Ontario, to make this a reality. And we hope that it will also be beneficial to the city of Auburn as well. Thank you so much. Laura, did you have something you wanted to add, please? Sorry. No, no, be behind you here. The Harry Tubman Boosters Club would like to thank Mayor Quill and City Council for their support of Auburn's Tubman legacy. If the communities that hold this history don't demonstrate our respect and admiration, we can't expect anyone else to do it. Our hope is that this sister city's relationship will be good for tourism and its impact on the economy, that it may support the establishment of a national park in Auburn, as well as to raise awareness and appreciation, not only locally but nationally, for the heroic humanitarian deeds of Harriet Tubman. Thank you. Thank you, Laurel. Thank you. Uh, Reverend Carter and, and Laurel, if you need more copies of that proclamation, please, if one of you just take the list and we'll get the correct number to you and, and we'll take, care of, take it from this point, so, okay? Thank you. Public announcements. None, Mayor. None. <laughs> City manager's report. Uh, just a few items, Mayor. Um, I'm happy to report uh, we were able to sell uh, bond anticipation notes. Uh, they were sold today. We got a 1.25% interest rate. This is uh, a bond anticipation note, or we call them bands, that will fund the purchase of the landfill gas to electric uh, generating station, the Franklin Street Pipeline project, city road and sidewalk projects, and the DPW trucks and street sweeper that were previously approved by the city council. Um, item two, we've been discussing trying to get city council and county legislators together. I think 
we've arrived at a date. We've had a few false starts, but it looks like March 26th at 6 p.m. Uh, we'll be uh, contacting the, the college to see if we can't use the college as a uh, place to have the meeting. The uh, topics tentatively would be discussion of shared services opportunities, uh, as the city and the county power agencies, and of course the, the payment on the 911 radio system. Uh, we're anticipating a meeting of about 90 minutes and uh, hopefully this is the first of several meetings that will occur between the city council and the county legislature. Uh, and then last item, the budget work sessions. Last meeting I proposed uh, Wednesdays and Thursdays. Uh, those dates weren't working for everybody. So what I'd like to do is propose the budget workshops where department heads will give details about their operations and their proposed budgets to be on Thursday, March 13th, Saturday morning, March 15th from 9 to 11, Thursday, March 20th at regular council meeting time, and Saturday, March 22nd at nine, uh, from 9 to 11. Uh, it may be easier if we could do those meetings in uh, the training room where we can sit at a, a common table. Um, so I'd be interested in the council's input on that. I understand that was done in years past yes. and it worked well. So it works. Or would those meetings be taped, Doug? Uh, yes. Isn't it easier to have them taped here though? It's a little crowded up I, there. Or? We'd have to ask our videographer. He's done it up there before. Well, I I prefer in the council chambers, but that's just my personal preference on it. Okay. Up in the um, training room, it's more of a work session. Work, it's more, and there is the screen, and uh, the the equipment is there to um, to be able to look, view things. There's a place for the public to sit. Years ago, but it's it's. Go ahead. I, oh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt. That's okay. Years ago, we did it that way. It was more conducive to a discussion. Um, uh, about that, it was. I don't know. It worked. Uh, I mean, we could try one and see how it goes. The, the only the only problem that I would have is um, I know in a couple of meetings we've had up there in the past, um, when the public comes in, and I I would invite the public because this is part of their their budget, um, op, you know, review also, and I just want to make sure we have the room so that people don't feel crowded in a in a oh, small room like that. So I want to make sure that the um, general public has an opportunity to come in and see a full. Uh, presentation of the budget and feel comfortable coming in a room that's not so close quarters as the third floor is. I, I see uh, both uh, Councilor McCormick and Councilor Camardo's points. Uh, I do think that it might be worth trying to have the work session um, in, that is in a place that is more conducive to the kinds of discussions that need, need to happen. Um, and if there is an influx of, of uh, the public then uh, perhaps change the venue the next time. Uh, but I, 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 I kind of like the idea of having us uh, around a table and really kind of getting into the, into the nuts and bolts, if you will, of the, uh, of the budget process. So I can understand, and, and again, obviously, if there's a lot of people that show up, then obviously we would have to do something else, but let's see how it works in, in, uh, in the uh, training room. I think the power agency meets up there every month. I don't think they've had any problems. Yeah. Councilor Rizika? I, I really don't have any preference. Uh, it's, it's basically if, if the uh, volume of people that attend uh, preclude us being in, uh, holding it in the uh, training room, we just move down here anyhow. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I agree with Councilor Cabardo. I, 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 if the third floor is set up to house a number of visitors, that that's fine. I, I don't feel we need the the rectangular shaped tables as we have presently up there. Uh, while it does work for a more intimate conversation with the department heads, I do want to make it as, avail as available as we can to the general public. So I, I would lean more towards the side of, of council chambers unless we come up with something creative in the third floor. So we're all over the board. Okay. <laughs> Could we I try didn't mean it to once? Create controversy. <laughs> Could we try it once? Because you can make. I've made the ta the tables can be done any way you want to do them. What if we try the Saturday morning one up up there the first Saturday? That would be. Okay. I'm, I'm not sure that that's going to be a work, big public turnout on Saturday. Yeah, Thursday nights will will be held here as normal. Yeah, that's what I thought was going to happen. And then Saturday, 
Oh, that's uh, a good idea. Saturday upstairs, so okay. it's all about compromise. Okay. Kind of a, ca a business casual? Affair. Business casual, yeah, that's preference of the, the individual days. counselors. Saturday morning. Cereal. Okay. A little clear for you. Got it. Okay, thank you. And that's all I have, Mayor. Thank you. Seeker resolutions. Seeker resolution number 29 of 2014, terming a type two action for improvements to the city water supply and distribution system. Do we have a sponsor? Councilor Rizika, seconded by Councilor Cuddy. Seeker resolution number 29 of 2014, determining that the proposed action is type two action for purposes of the New York State Environmental Quality Review Act. Whereas the City Council of the City of Auburn, New York is <clears throat> considering undertaking the reconstruction of the city's water supply and distribution system, including the reconstruction and improvement of the existing water filtration plant and pumping stations, and including the replacement of furnishings, equipment, machinery, or apparatus required for the purposes for which such water filtration plant and pumping stations are to be used, and whereas the pursuant as and whereas pursuant to the New York State Environmental Quality Review Act and the regulations adopted pursuant thereto by the Department of Environmental Conservation of the State of New York, being six NYCRR part six one seven as amended, the city desires to comply with the Seeker Act and the regulations with respect to the project. Now therefore, be it resolved by the members of the City Council of the City of Auburn, New York as follows. One, the project constitutes a type two action under 6 NYCRR section 617.5 C2 and no further action under the Seeker Act and the regulations is required. Two, this resolution shall take effect immediately. The foregoing resolution, oh, it's okay. back to you, Mayor. <laughs> Discussion? <laughs> Councilor Cuddy. I think based on uh, the uh, presentation uh, last week from uh, Christina Selvik and, uh, and uh, Tom Gayback's presentation earlier, um, I think this is uh, definitely worth, worth uh, voting for. Very good. Anyone else? Clerk, if you call the roll, please. Councillor McCormick? Aye. Councillor Camardo? Yes. Councillor Cuddy? Yes. Councillor Rosica? Yes. Mayor Quill? Aye. <clears throat> Carried. Adoption of bond ordinance number one of 2014, authorizing the issuance of $3.4 million serial bonds for the city water supply and distribution system. Do we have a sponsor? Councillor Cuddy? Seconded by Councillor McCormick. Mayor, uh, this resol this ordinance was read last week. Would you like me to read it, or would you like me to waive the reading, or would you like to waive the reading? Would I, with council's permission, I just like you to read the pertinent uh, uh, portions as you did last week. Bond ordinance number one of 2014, be it ordained by the city by the council of the city of Auburn, New York, as follows. The City of Auburn, New York is hereby authorized to undertake the reconstruction of the city's water supply and distribution system, including the reconstruction and improvement of the existing water filtration plant and pumping stations, and including the replacement of furnishings, equipment, machinery, or apparatus required for the purposes for which such water filtration plant and pumping stations are to be used at an estimated maximum cost of $3,400,000 and to issue an aggregate $3,400,000 in serial bonds pursuant to the provisions of the local finance law to finance the estimated costs of the aforesaid object or purpose. It is hereby determined that the maximum estimated cost of the aforesaid specific object or purpose is $3,400,000. Said amount is hereby appropriated therefore and the plan for the financing thereof shall consist of the issuance of $3,400,000 in serial bonds of the city authorized to be issued pursuant to this ordinance. It is hereby determined that the period of probable usefulness of the aforesaid specific object or purpose is 40 years, pursuant to paragraph one of section 11A of the local finance law. Pursuant to section 107, 
D3A of the local finance law, current funds are not required to be provided prior to the issuance of the bonds or any bond anticipation notes issued in anticipation of issuance of the bonds. The council hereby determines that the provisions of the State Environmental Quality Review Act and the mm -hmm. regulations thereunder have previously been satisfied with respect to the expenditures authorized by this ordinance, and this ordinance shall take effect immediately upon its adoption. Council, Council Camargo. Um, Doug, um, I believe we're, we're applying for a grant to get 0% uh, financing on this project, yes. correct? Yes, it's a hardship financing, yes. And as we all know, these are much needed uh, projects in the city, but I just wanna go over a few things here, and I'm concerned about if we don't get the 0% financing, how this would impact the water and sewer, or at least the water rates in the years to come, because we're gonna be bonding over 20 years and the amortization schedule would look um, in the following way. If we were to bond over 20 years and we were to get 3.5%, that would cost, the total interest on that amortization schedule would be $1,341,100. If we were to be able to get 1.5%, that would be $560,625. So that would be over a 20 year period that would have a direct impact on the water rates that are charged to the taxpayers of this community or the users of this community. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to amend the resolution stating that if we didn't um, receive the 0% financing, the grant, that it would come back to council for further review. And part of the further review would be, I would wanna know the impact that it would, that it would have with uh, relations to uh, future water billing and to see the whole it spelled out because um, I'm under the understanding you just sold serial bonds for one and a half percent. This amortization schedule says that if we sold bonds at one and a half percent, that would cost roughly half a million dollars to the users over a 20 year period. So I'd like to make a motion that I have no problem if this um, Resolution goes through if we get the zero percent, but if not, that it would be brought back to council for further review. Is there a second on it, Councilor Ezekiel? You second it, sir? Yes. Okay. I, I'm going to ask the clerk to read it back so we make sure we have the correct Absolutely. language. Absolutely, sure. Good. Sure. An amendment's been offered um, to add language that would say that if zero percent financing is not approved, this will come back to the council for further review. Correct discussion in that regard and I was just going to say Sorry, that there's no. a deadline I believe of March 1st to get this in for the submit submit yes. it correct Councilor McCormick can we amend a, a bond ordinance I think there are not uh, can we do that sure you can if we if we can't get the percent zero percent financing then the bond wouldn't be passed or the bond wouldn't be um, sold or put out the well, bond you've already uh, had a sale of Bond anticipation notes, correct? Not for this project. Not for this project? Yeah. I guess you can. Sure, sure you can. Oh, I didn't know because usually they come from, they're reviewed by a financial consultant. Well, they are, but it's still part of a, a grant that's going to be yeah. submitted to the state for 0% financing. And I guess that would say yeah. go through DASNY or some, some. If there is an issue with that, we will uh, bring it back. Uh, bring it back anyway uh, after consultation with Bond Council. EFC, I think you're referring to. Yes, it yeah, could be. Yes, Environmental Facility yeah. Corporation. So, so in essence, we it would be brought back to us anyway, so we wouldn't really have to amend the. Uh, well, right now we're, we're passing a bond resolution that would just be even if it wasn't for zero, it'd still be sold on the open market for whatever rate the city would be, um, you know, apply for or able to apply for. And I have concerns that if we don't do this, we're going to have some major debt service to pay back and who knows what kind of interest rate that it'll come back at so and that's going to of course impact our future water rates with our users in the city council mccormick uh, by passing the bond ordinance we don't nothing happens until we actually do the project go out to bid and, and actually pull the trigger on the money is, is that true this doesn't actually Bond, borrow the money the bonds would be sold if we pass this tonight yeah you'd be authorizing the sale of the bonds you would be right away oh okay <coughs> any other discussion so can i uh, so can we vote on my motion to amend the 
that's, that's what we're going to okay, call that. I appreciate we're call that vote. I just want to give everyone a chance to speak, yeah, Council. I have a question for Council. We have a, I have a, may I ask a question? Please. Sure. I have a question for Councilor Rossi. Um, the, according to the rules, we read the first reading of the ordinance last week. If the ordinance is amended this week, does that affect anything? What I'm, what I'm wondering is if, we, if the council passes the bond ordinance, and then if we maybe, instead of amending the bond ordinance, uh, brought up a specific resolution directing the manager that if the 0% oh, yeah. financing is not achieved, to bring it back to the council immediately. I, I, my question's for, for the well, Corporation the, the, Council. The first reading is only a formality not a format, it's a requirement. It could have been waived if you wanted to. Okay. Um, but uh, I don't think that that would affect uh, amending it at this point. Uh, I am, um, as I stated, I'm not totally sure because all of this is prepared by bond council who are very specialized in this area. Uh, however, um, if this amendment is improper, then we'd have to revisit it next week. We got time to do it. Sure, because I, I do know that we're on a timeline to publish this tomorrow. Yeah, we're on a timeline to meet the grant application. Yeah. We're not in a timeline to pass a bond to do the Correct. improvements. Just we're prepared to get this published tomorrow. So they're not um, tied together then. The bond and the grant, the grant and the bond aren't connected. You don't have to have one to do the other. No, the, it's, the bond is to pay the debt. And, and we might be able to get the debt at 0% interest through EFC. If not, Vicki. I'm definitely not a professional on this, but Christina told me this tonight. You have to have the bond in place, but we don't pull off that. You, you get the, the money from EFC and we pay that back, but they require you to have the bond. And I, again, I'm not an expert on this, but she made sure she told me that for tonight. So that, that doesn't make sense to me. How do you, how do you um, get a bond if you don't know what interest rate you're paying on the bond? We're applying for a grant. We're, well, we're applying for we're, money from EFC. It's not applying, really a grant, but. We're applying for a grant through, this, through AFC to uh, subsidize the 0% financing on the bond. Correct. But what Christina told me is that the bond is required but we don't draw off it. It's it's something there, but we don't draw off it. We draw off the EFC money. EFC pays the bond. So if we don't get the zero percent financing, and if the bond's written for three and a half percent, that means the city's on the hook for three and a half percent. But I guess this has to come back anyways, right? No, it before doesn't. it goes to bond. Not if if you we do it pass that the way. bond tonight, it's done. And norm normally, the ordinance is authority to issue the debt. Whether we do that immediately or not is, I guess, subject to an amendment here, in determining what the the rate will be. Well, I have no I have actually. no problem moving forward with the bond as long as it's there at zero percent. Is my yeah. is my point. But if I it's at a higher do. rate, then we have to come back to council for further review. Yeah. I guess let me just interject one other question. If it doesn't come back at zero percent, what do we do? Well, we might have to look at the whole project because uh, you have, uh, and furthermore, is I'd want to know what kind of impact this would be to fu for our future um, rate payers, and, and you're talking a half a million dollars at one and a half percent. If it came back at three and a half percent, you're talking a million and a half dollars or a million point four. So that's a s substantial amount of money that we'd be looking to, tran to pass on to the rate payers in this community. I, then, uh, I guess. My question is um, that um, there were in-depth discussions about the monies uh, from the bond sale, which would be used for the infrastructure and equipment. And um, if you're calling it back, uh, are you talking about scrapping all of those projects that you talked about? No, just on this I have one. no idea until we find out what, what we're going to be paying on it roughly what kind of interest we're going to be paying and have an analysis of how this is going to impact future payments to that uh, to that sewer to the water fund um one other comment and again i'm not positive about this but if you don't get the zero percent even though you have the bond out there you could just never draw off the bond so you would never have to pay unless it we give, unless we give direction to the staff that's that's just going it's just going to go forward 
if you don't give direction, it will never draw any money off the bonds. So you'll never have to pay any percent interest. So if you don't get the zero percent that you wanted, if you got one and a half and you decided you wanted to do it, then maybe we would draw off the bond. But, but uh, Councilor Cuddy? I, I just want to stress the importance of um, upgrading and maintaining our infrastructure as, uh, as uh, Mr. Gayback mentioned earlier tonight. Um, and I understand Councilor Camardo's concerns about future, uh, um, you know, the potential of it being higher interest rate than zero percent. Um, I, I really think that you know, if it's at one percent um, or 0.5 percent, obviously um, that's not as ideal as zero percent. But I really do think we should move forward uh, with with this uh, this the reconstruction effort of our of our water and sewer uh, infrastructure. Um, and we saw yesterday, uh, last week's last week's uh, presentation and the the water uh, filtration plant and uh, you know I, I really think we should be forward thinking and investing in our infrastructure is only going to make the city more attractive to businesses and I I, I understand uh, you know to to want to put a uh, a uh, percentage in there but I don't know um, if uh, you know, I, I think time is of the essence. I would, I, I do support uh, um, moving forward with this, and uh, you know, I, I know we're at the motion to table the table it, but no, no, to, to, uh, amend, to it. amend it. But um, I'm, I, I really think we should move forward. I, I, I follow Councillor Camardo's logic perfectly. I, I do agree that we need to understand how this is going to impact the rates over in the debt service uh, in depth. I do not see a problem with us making this amendment. Uh, if it's unachievable, then it simply comes back for a re-review and, and then whatever it is, we're gonna have to probably make the decision if, if we wanna move on that or not. Obviously, it is very important that we maintain this infrastructure. But we also have to understand fully the impact of the rates and, and basically it's our community that's paying these rates. So I, I think we need to achieve a balance here. Uh, we do need to have this infrastructure maintained. However, we also have to be cognizant of the rates that we're charging for this. Councilor McCormick, one, one second, um, please. I, I, everybody understands trying to be cautious, but I have confidence um, Christina is very thorough. If there was any any chance that this wouldn't go as it's, as it's planned to go, um, I'm sure she would have uh, let us know or done something. I think we're at a point right now that if we don't, if we do anything with this, we risk it coming back to us, and it would risk the deadline, and that's just too much at risk, <laughs> or too much at stake, because this this. Um, all the things that are covered by the, this bond ordinance and the, the grant that she's writing are critical to the water supply of the city. These, I think Tony said last week, or, or the whoever gave the presentation, I can't remember, that some of it hasn't been um, repaired or re replaced since the 20s. So we really need to um, get this done, even if it was it did come to the, down to that we had to pay a certain percentage. I think the ratepayers in Auburn want to have good, clean, uh, reliable uh, water supply. Uh, they wouldn't want to, you know, do this in a way that would jeopardize the water supply of the community. So I'm um, I'm I'm for going for this bond ordinance the way it, the way it's written. Oh, I have a question. Hold on, hold on Council, one minute, please, Mr. Selby, and then Mr. Camaro. I just wanted to add a piece of information. At the, the meeting where we discussed this last week, we gave a range of rate impacts. Uh, I was looking through my book. I didn't bring that really handout. And I think current rate, $2.05. I think we forecast it might go to two fifteen. Mm -hmm. with, uh, let's see. It could go as high as two dollars and eighteen cents, depending on uh, the interest rate we get. So, that that would kind of be at the high end. Yeah. 
Councilor Cavardo? Yes, uh, Mayor, there's no question that anybody has that certain work has to be done, but last week it came to our attention um, because of time was on the of, of the essence to have this place through there hasn't been any, any thorough um, investigation of the water budget or how it, w it would impact uh, the users the users in this community who are taxed enough as it is already not only through property taxes but through water and sewer um, rates so i think we need to have a, fur a further analysis of how this would impact what rate it would be how much more it would cost the taxpayers and this came to us last week because we're we're under the under a deadline i believe by march 1st so if it doesn't get sold then it comes back to council for further review that's all i'm asking is for some caution and to have a full analysis of uh uh, what it's going to cost the taxpayers, and I, I think Martin, we should have that uh, review. So thank you. So, so I, I, I guess I don't really understand the risk. If we go ahead forward and say amend this and say that we're we're preferring a zero percent bond, uh, and it's awarded, all well and good. If it's not, then we could come back and review it. I mean, I guess I don't really see where there's a risk here. Well, first of all, you're not going to get a zero percent bond. You're banking on the grant from EFC. Correct in order to get a 0% financing. It's being sub supplemented by the state. That's correct. correct. We're under, we understand that. Yeah. My point is if it doesn't get past that zero, if we don't get that supplement from the state, that it would come back to council for, for further review. So I'm gonna call the question if I can on the uh, um, amendment, if I could please. Everyone has spoken except myself and-, and I'm sorry, go no, ahead. No, 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 that's, that's the way it works. It's, uh, I would much rather wait to see if we get a better rate, but at the same time, it's past councils for decades have been blamed for not taking, doing work on the infrastructure. I don't want us to be saddled with the same name. I, I feel we should move forward with the bond as written, and that's the way I'll be voting. But at the same time, we still can keep our eyes open in, in, in hopefully we can come up with a 0% grant from the state. So clerk, if you'll call the roll in regards to the amendment, please. Okay, so the amendment, would be uh, if 0% financing from the state DEC, and I can't remember the exact if the name. The grant is not EFC. I submitted. Think. EFC, okay. Environmental. Environ oh, that's Service right. Corporation. So if the 0% financing from the state Environmental Facilities Corporation is not approved, this will come back to the council for further review. Correct. Okay, so there's a Motion to amend. Right. And I think cut by Councilor Camardo. Councilor Rizika seconded. Okay. Yes, thank you. The question has been called, so if you'd call the roll, please. Council McCormick? No. Councilor Camardo? Yes. Councilor Cuddy? No. Councilor Rizika? Yes. Uh, Mayor Quill? No. So let me ask a question. We need super majority to pass the bond, and I don't I don't see that happening at this stage of the game then. I don't know how we're going to move forward with this. We, we can't. Well, follow the roll. Is there further discussion in regards to the bond ordinance? It just puts me in a diff very difficult situation here to vote on something that we don't know the full impact of the taxpayers of this community, and I'm, I'm not going to support it at this stage of the game till I know further, till I have further information and know a little better how that's going to impact the ratepayers of this community. So I will not sp be supporting this at this stage of the game. Councilor puts all of us in a difficult situation. Yes. Can I appeal Com to Councilor Com Camardo? I, I really think that, uh, you know, because of the opportunity for the 0% uh, grant, uh, I think I can understand your, your um, concern and prudence about moving forward. Um, you know, I, <laughs> I think that our uh, water and sewer are one of the biggest assets of this community. And uh, this is going to help uh, attract business. This is going to help improve our drinking water. And I just, I, I don't want to see it, um, it, it um, hindered, uh, or this, this, this order, this not passing this ordinance tonight hinder the progress that we can, we can actually uh, get uh, if we, if we if we do pass this ordinance. Then, so. then support the, the the amendment to have it come back if it didn't pass zero so that we can have, we can do our due diligence to the taxpayers of this community. I and I understand that we need, um, our infrastructure needs work. 
but it needs to be affordable to our taxpayers also. I and we need to do the due, due diligence that hasn't happened in the past, and that needs to happen. And can I, can sure, I also, I, yes, sir, also right. respond by, by saying that the range at which um, best case scenario, uh, $2.05 and worst case scenario, $2.18. So there is a range in which we know, it, we know what the rates could be given these upgrades. And, you know, I, I just want to be clear about why it's important as a council to, to, um, to pass this because what it's saying is that it, it's, it's, as Mr. Quill, as, as uh, Mayor Quill said, um, there's been previous councils that have had, that have failed to invest in the infrastructure of our water and sewer as much as we need to, as much as we need to. And I really think, you know, this is important that we, we do move forward on this. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm appealing for your support to see how, to see how important it is. And, and I understand the amendment um, being a, uh, you know, asking for the, having it be contingent on, on a 0% grant, but I'm not sure if that would, if that is going to affect um, the overall bond ordinance to begin with. So I, I really think that us passing it as is without any contingencies is going to be uh, act of good faith towards our employees uh, that have prepared this. And, um, and again, I believe we have done due diligence given at last week's presentation. And, and I, you know, I'm, it's, it's very unfortunate that this might not pass tonight, but I really believe that um, it's, 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 it's crucial to, uh, to our city. Council McCormick, please. Did I, I think I heard, I think Vicki, March 1st is the deadline, is that right? Yes. And the bond is tied to this, so uh, if, if, there's, if this doesn't pass, it's a lose-lose kind of a thing. Uh, we don't make the deadline, we don't get the grant, but we still need to make the repairs to the infrastructure. It's not about improvements, it's about just getting main basic services. And um, while every time we turn on our faucet right now, we get water, uh, that doesn't mean it's gonna happen. That's how severe the need is for this, these repairs to be made. I don't think, uh, I think getting a 0% uh, grant to cover the bonding is like great. It's like a bonus if we got it. But I think we'd still have to do this and we need to do it and we shouldn't, um, I, I know we've talked about the need to do this previously. You have to do the due diligence in order to apply for these things. Um, I, I know for a year or more, um, it's been reviewed and looked at, and I really think it's critical that we keep on time with the bond so that the grant can be applied for. Councilor Camardo. I, I think Councilor Rizika was ahead of me, but I'm sorry. go, go ahead. I, I still didn't have, I don't believe I have an answer, but what is the risk if we had amended this and we made it contingent on that 0% financing? that all that would did mean is that this would just come back and be re-reviewed. I, like I say, it, where's the risk? I think the risk from what Vicki stated was that if this bond is not in place by March 1, we forfeit the right to get that grant. Well, the bond is gonna be in place, John. The only amendment is gonna be if it's not, if it's not subsidized by 0%, it would come back to council and the bond would not go forward. Exactly. Um, it was voted down, but right, ahead, exactly. Please. I just want to make that clear, Councillor. Um, we talk about past councils, and I don't want to blame past councils for anything. Uh, we're sitting here now. We make the determination on what happens and how we move forward. But if past councils had done the due diligence that I'm asking about, that we had a thorough, thorough review of finances before we took on major um, decisions that the city was going to be faced for we probably wouldn't be in as bad a shape as we are right now, unfortunately. We're in a very difficult situation financially. The taxpayers are taxed very, very difficult in this community, not only with property taxes, as I stated before,
but also when I was on the campaign trail. I don't know how many times people talked about water and sewer. That was the biggest um, payment that they had to make that, that they had a big concern for. Last week, we didn't do our due diligence. We didn't review the budget and how it was going to impact the, um, the taxpayers of this community. Right now, we're facing, if we were to sell this bond at 3.5%, that would be an additional $1.4 million in debt service that the taxpayers would have to pay for over 20 years. Even if we sold it for 1.5%, uh, which Doug just told us they sold bonds from this morning, that's a half a million dollars, additional dollars. Now, there's no question in my mind that we need this work, that we need to be done, but I want to make sure it's done in a fair and equitable way to the taxpayers of this community. So I can't understand why we can't have an amendment that if we don't make that, it comes back to us, we have further review on it, we do the due diligence, it was voted down, and I'm going to have a tough time supporting the bond because of that, because I don't know what it's going to be sold for, and neither do you or anybody else here at council. I understand that. So, but I I, I know Vicki wants to talk. I'm, I'm going to, then I'll, I'll, I'll say something else. Um, just one other comment that uh, tonight you're also going to be, there's a resolution on here for the professional engineering services agreement. That's part of this bond that we have to put that in there. So there won't be time to, to do it all if you don't pass it till next week. Um, we did give you a range of what the rates would be. The seven cents, um, which would then bring your rate up to 212, um, would be if you had a 30 year bond or 30 year at 0%. The uh, 13 cents is if you had 20 years at the highest, which was I think four and a half, hang on, which is at, I'm sorry, three and a half percent. And that was at the, then at your rate would be 218. Those are projected numbers. Yes. And unfortunately, sometimes our projected numbers don't come to fruition when we're setting rates and things happen down the road. Um, well, it depends those on are, they, and I guess last week you also asked a question about retirement of bonds, which was a good question. But unfortunately, our, our soonest two bonds that will be retired won't be till 2023 for this, for the water fund. So Mr. Rossi and Mr. Or Mr. Selby, if I understand this correctly, if, if if we do not pass this bond ordinance tonight, we can't even apply for the EFC grant. It, that's gone, correct? The bond has to be in place to do it. If, if we don't pass it, then we're just out the, out, we're out the window. We're, we're done. I, I am not privy. Um, we do have a meeting, one more meeting before the first. Um, I don't know the, uh, the memorandum certainly states that uh, uh, we have to have uh, the uh, bond in place in order to be eligible for the 0% financing. Um, and we have to provide an executed engineering services agreement, which is the next resolution, all by March 1st. So it's, uh, that's, those are the deadlines that I understand. What, what is, and maybe Laura, maybe Laura's not up to speed with this yet. She, she thought she ducked the issue, or Vicki. But what is the time frame that we we could expect from EFC in regards to uh, receiving the, 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 the grant? I'm not sure on that, but I was just going to remind you that next Thursday we won't know whether we get 0% or not. So it's going to be the same as what you have tonight. That's not the question. The question is that if we didn't get the 0, we could come back. And, and it could take 30 days. It could take 45 days. Who knows? But... I just wanted to see that the um, amendment was on there, that if we didn't get the zero, it would come back to council for further review. Well, every contract, and I know this doesn't mean the, the uh, percentage, but every contract will come back to council before we do any work. Once we pass a, a bond, yeah. it doesn't come back. I, I know it doesn't matter the rate, but I just want to let you know re that we, everything would come back to you. Also, I'd like to offer compromise. Vicki, stay right there, and I'd like your feeling also. I'd like to table this for one week, which would be the 27th of February. It's not the first of March, but that is as close as we're going, because our me next meeting will be into March, so we'll be out of the box. I, I, I'd like to make a motion we table this item and the next item for one week. And what would that, what would it, you, are you making a motion? I just want to ask you a question. Uh, please. What would that do for us, though? Would that well, it, it, it's, it's, it's not going to be the end-all, do-all. It's going to get us a little bit closer to the March 1st deadline. 
we close? past that. We're, we're past the March 1st deadline. I don't have any problem if you want to further review it. I just have what some I, concerns. I, and what I'm asking, Vicki, will we know by the 27th? So that, that's what mm -hmm. you're saying, so. No, we won't know. Um, I was just gonna say something else now I don't remember, but uh, uh, <laughs> um, I was just wondering if you could read the original, um, the, um, the original bond ordinance again and see if people would vote on that. The original one, not amended, and see if you get the votes. Uh, I think if, if you're going to do that, and it's not going to pass, um, we have to play with a, uh, you know, bringing it back before the council. So, in my opinion, right now, I would think you're probably better served to table it for a week, see what information you can obtain, and further to find out whether or not. Uh, in my mind, whether or not the uh, bond resolution is capable of being amended. I have no problem with that. Okay, so I, there's a motion. Mr. I, I'll just add that nothing really will change in terms of analysis. We've calculated the potential range of rate impacts, and that's, that's what we'll bring back next week, well, which you already have. Did you, I don't think your analysis, and if I could, I don't think your analysis took into full consideration if this bond was sold at three and a half percent was it yes the highest rate the highest rate was involved in there the three and a half percent okay so I, i'm just no no please just just want to let the council know i don't think there's anything more that staff can give you next week than we've already provided i'll second your motion mayor and, and i and i'd like to motion to second and i'd like to table it we can't even discuss it now as i recall yes the motion to table we have to vote on the motion okay Call the roll to sure a motion to table bond ordinance number one uh councillor mccormick i'm thinking <laughs> um i out of courtesy i would i'll vote to table it um but i am so uh wholeheartedly in favor of this i don't want to I have confidence in the city staff that is behind this and i don't want to second guess them i think we've seen what happens when second guessing <clears throat> is done i really do have confidence in them but to to make sure this passes i will vote to table it councillor camardo councillor first of all there's, n there's nothing about having confidence in anybody i have confidence in all the city staff there's just some questions that i want answered here and they haven't been answered so i will vote yes councillor cuddy before I vote, I want to say that I um, wholeheartedly support this bond ordinance, and um, to, I am vo I'm going to be voting. I'm going to I'm going to vote yes uh, to table it because I, I want my colleague to see uh, and to do. To, to do his, both colleagues to do their due diligence to, to see um, the range that may exist. And um, I, I believe that, um, as I said, time is of the essence and we do need to uh, pass this. So yes. Councilor Rosica? Yes. Mayor Quill. Uh, I asked for I asked for this to be tabled because I wanted to give everyone a chance to to look this over again. It has no no bearing on city staff or whatever. Uh, the same mo the same bond ordinance will come back up next week. But I want to give every member of council ample opportunity to investigate this further if they f so desire. So I'm voting yes. The uh, bond ordinance number one is tabled. Mr. Rossi, in, in regards to resolution uh, number 30, should that be pulled or do we bring it to the floor and then table that? I, I would bring it to the floor and table it because that absolutely goes hand in hand with the adoption of the bond ordinance. Very good. Agreement resolution number 30 of 2014, authorizing a professional engineering services agreement with CRA for the city water supply and distribution system improvement project. Do we have a sponsor? Councilor Rizika, seconded by Councilor Camardo. This time I'll entertain a motion to table by Councilor McCormick, seconded by Councilor Camardo. Would you call the roll in regards to that, please? Sure. You don't want it read? Nah, you better read it into the record, please.
Agreement resolution number 30 of 2014, authorizing professional services agreement with Conestoga Rovers and Associates for the city water supply and distribution system improvement project. Whereas the city of Auburn water filtration plant, pumping stations and distribution system provide <coughs> drinking water for nearly 45,000 customers in Cuga County. And whereas the water system requires capital infrastructure improvements to the buildings, equipment, pumps and motors at the rapid sand filtration plant, sedimentation basin, lower pump station and upper pump station structures. And whereas the city of Auburn has requested and received a professional engineering services proposal from Conestoga Rovers and Associates in the amount of $348,900 for services related to the planning and regulatory compliance, design and engineering and construction inspection services for the water supply and distribution system improvement project. Now therefore be it resolved by the City Council of the City of Auburn, New York, that it does hereby authorize the mayor to enter into professional services agreement with CRA of Buffalo, New York at a cost not to exceed $348,900 to be charged to a designated capital account entitled Water Plant and Pumping Stations Account number HF8330.440.8 D. Thank you. And then there's a motion by Councilor McCormick, I believe, and second by Councilor Camardo to table. Mm -hmm. Motion to table. Councillor McCormick? Aye. Councillor Camardo? Yes. Councillor Cuddy? Yes. Councillor Rusica? Yes. Mayor Quill? Aye. Council resolution number 31 of 2014, authorizing the mayor to sign an asset purchase agreement. Do we have a sponsor? Councillor Camardo, seconded by Councillor Rusica. Council resolution number 31 of 2014, authorizing the mayor to sign an asset purchase agreement. Whereas the city of Auburn has entered into negotiations for the purchase of the landfill gas electric generation facility, currently owned and operated by CH Auburn Energy LLC. And whereas the city has entered into a letter of intent dated November 22nd, 2013, wherein the city expresses its intention to move forward with the purchase of all of the tangible and intangible assets used in the operation of the landfill gas electric generation facility. And whereas it is necessary that the parties enter into an asset purchase agreement, whereby the city will purchase all of the rights, title and interest of all of the assets and property used by CH Auburn Energy LLC in connection with the generation facility, and whereas the parties have agreed on a price for the asset purchase agreement in an amount of $4,900,000, and it is necessary that the city grant the mayor the authority to sign said agreement. Now therefore be it resolved that the Auburn City Council does hereby authorize the mayor to sign an asset purchase agreement with CH Auburn Energy LLC for the city's purchase of a landfill gas electric generation facility situated on Allen Street in the city of Auburn. Mr. Rossi, before we get into discussion, is this a simple majority or is a super majority required? Uh, simple majority, this is just an authorization to sign an agreement. Thank you. Discussion, Council? Council McCormick? A question, it's just a little tiny technical, CH Auburn Energy, is it still CH Auburn? Yes. That's the acronym by which they... They still go... Yes. They still go by, yeah. I thought it was Green something or other. Uh, Greenfield. Greenfield? Yeah. No, no, Greenfield is a... Different. Uh, is a different company which happens to have the same principles uh, owning that company as does the... Naturally. The uh, operational company that owns the assets at the facility. That figures. Anyone else? Oh. Oh, no, it, this kind of is, um, could we get a little like recap of why we're doing this and what, what it is so that the public knows, because this is a huge thing. Uh, to me it is. Well, this will come back when uh, the agreement's in place. Right, this is authorization, I know, but it's got the uh, dollar amount of 
too much. 3.4 million in here. 4.9. 4. point. Is it 4.3? It's right there. I can't see it. I can't find it. Yeah, it's a lot of money. And uh, <laughs> I think we should recap what what it is. Yeah. Mr. Selby's going to give a recap. Right. I'll just briefly, I, I happen to have my notes here. Um, this is a, a facility that converts the gas that's coming from our landfill into electricity, and it was developed by a private party. Uh, the city has a contract with that private party to buy the energy. Uh, the facility's operated at financial loss to the city since it started operation almost four years ago. Those losses are due to an agreement that requires the city to buy more energy than actually is generated, and then when we sell excess energy, we sell it actually at a loss. So over the term of this agreement, we forecast our losses would far exceed the purchase price that uh, has been offered here. It was a difficult negotiation because the current owners really don't have any incentive to sell. They are almost assured positive cash flow out of this project. So uh, it took some period of time to get it negotiated. The original agreement also was a 15-year agreement. At the end of that term, uh, the ESA, the, the uh, Energy Service Sales Agreement, would have expired, but the city would not have owned the facility even then. So we would have had to buy it at the end of 15 years. So all in all, our assessment of this was that it's to the city's financial advantage over the long term to purchase the facility. The uh, outcome of this purchase, we've run pro formas, various uh, scenarios. Uh, largely depends on the energy costs, uh, what we get for the energy sales. Uh, worst case, we're estimating we could lose 75000 a year. Best case, uh, we could make several hundred thousand dollars a year. So um, it's much better than our current sustained losses of, uh, you know, approaching a million dollars a year in some years. Thank you. Councilor Zika. Yeah, in regards to the uh, the uh, energy services agreement here, and now when this agreement was signed, they, all the inputs in the count to the council to make this decision obviously had to be overwhelmingly supportive because this agreement was signed. If it, if it didn't have the support of all city staff and uh, any council, legal council, inside, outside, it wouldn't have been signed. Now, nobody at that time could have predicted the future and predicted how this would turn out. And it's a very brief history in the council resolution number 88 of July 24th, 2008. The declaration of lead agency and the final uh, environmental assessment was completed in January 2009. Members of this council were the council of members prior to uh, Councilor Camardo and myself, which were Mayor Quill, uh, Smith, Graney, Brower, and, and McNabb. Uh, the final draft energy service agreement, of course, if you look in the uh, the memorandum here was signed on uh, March 31st, 2009 by Mayor Quill, and on April 7th, uh, and this action was taken by a unanimous vote. Now, this purchase agreement and offer was initiated a year ago, and this is a large step in stopping losses at this cogen facility. And this begins closure for the city to move forward on this. And if, if those who want to same, assign blame, you just need to add your list, but let's just move forward. Thank you. Anyone else? I agree that this is a step in the right direction, but I also want, would like to say that I don't believe that all input of city staff was listened to at the time of this, and I believe that it's important that um, we can't just ignore the past. This has uh, basically moved $2.5 million out of our fund balance and we can't just pretend like it didn't happen. So, um, you know, this was a very big uh, issue in the campaign, and I would be remiss if I didn't, uh, you know, didn't at least acknowledge that there there were um, there were several instances where this could have been uh, stopped, and it wasn't. And now, finally, um, this council and the last council that actually went ahead and, and, and started the uh, healing process by, by buying this is doing the right thing. So, um, but I, I, we can't just ignore the past, Councilor Rizzico. Councilor, Next. we had a unanimous vote. Councilor Rizzico, Councilor McCormick. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. Um, 
because I was city clerk, it's unique. Uh, I was here uh, when this came about. It was in 2008, actually, that it was um, more or less cemented. Uh, and it was worked on from, I think, 2006, seven. It was a lot of work behind it. And um, I think it's a great example of uh, what happens when we do second guess uh, professionals and the staff and we go work around them. Uh, uh, this wasn't uh, something that was uh, wholeheartedly endorsed by people that worked here and, and are paid to do the things that they do that would um, uh, know whether that was a good idea or not. Myself, I wouldn't. I wouldn't know, but I have a lot of confidence in city employees, again, and uh, this, the money that we've been losing over the last few years is uh, unbelievable. It's really unbelievable how much money we've lost, and as, as Councilor Cuddy said, uh, as we went out last year and people were wondering why our services are being cut and, um, you know, things are this and that, and yes, the economy is bad, but the city was in pretty good shape. Um, I had a great general fund, and this really has done great damage, this project. Doing what we're going to do to um, repair it, it's still not going to be the greatest, but it is, as the manager explained, going to reduce what we were losing and make things as best as we can um, make the city's finances stable. Uh, might not make money, but it's not going to lose as much as it has been. Counselor? Yes. Uh, however, I, if if that was the case, then why did we have a unanimous vote on the floor on this? Um, I can't believe that five members of council would totally ignore recommendations of city staff and and agree to move forward on this. I, I, to me, that that doesn't hold water. I'm sorry, council. I was on on the council, and I'm just a little bit of a history lesson here. Uh, that was the vote, basically, where we decided not to incorporate the uh, uh, bio digest, the digester, because of, uh, it, it was just too cost prohibitive. It was the cities that thought at the time that it would be in the, wor in the correct direction to save money. Addressing the employees. One employee I found out years later was threatened with their job if they didn't stop talking about this. So uh, I, I can't say that everyone on board was on board with it. Some were told they were on board regardless. So with that, I'm going to call the question. Councilor, you haven't spoke yet, please. Just, just one thing. That's why I think it's, it's important for us as a council to make sure that we're doing our due diligence on every issue that comes in front of council, make sure we understand it, make sure we know all the outcomes. I know it's tough to predict the future on what things are going, or what's going to happen, but um, at least in my situation, I try to have as much information as possible because um, we're voting on important issues here that are going to impact the future of this community. So I think it's utmost important that we do our due diligence in every year, every issue that comes in front of us. Very good. Thank you. I believe everyone else has spoken in, in the issue. So would you call the roll, please? <clears throat> Council Resolution Number 31 of 2014. Councilor McCormick? Aye. Councilor Camardo? Yes. Councilor Cuddy? Yes. Councilor Rusica? Yes. Mayor Quill? Aye. Carried. Council Resolution Number 32, transferring parking meter enforcement functions and personnel from the Department of Public Works to the Auburn Police Department. Do we have a sponsor? Councilor Camardo, second by Councilor McCormick. Council Resolution Number 32 of 2014, transferring parking meter enforcement functions and the personnel from the Department of Public Works to the Auburn Police Department. Whereas the City of Auburn enforces parking regulations pursuant to Chapter 285 of the City Code, which includes provisions for penalties for violation of parking regulations, and whereas the City employs certain personnel to enforce regulations governing parking to include issue, issuing citations for violations associated with on and off street meter parking, and whereas the personnel who perform marking, parking meter enforcement are classified as parking meter attendants, and those personnel presently are members of the Department of Public Works, and whereas all other parking enforcement functions are carried out by the Auburn Police Department, and whereas it is desirable for operational efficiency that all parking enforcement functions be within the Auburn Police Department, 
Now therefore be it resolved that the city's parking meter attendants, their job functions and associated budgets will be transferred from the Department of Public Works to the Auburn Police Department and that the city manager is authorized to take necessary actions to implement the transfers. Thank you. Discussion. Please call the roll. Councilor McCormick? Aye. Councilor Camardo? Yes. Councilor Cuddy? Yes. Councilor Rusica? Yes. Mayor Quill? Aye. Carried. Appointment resolution number 33 of 2014, appointing a member of the board for assessment review. We have a sponsor. Councilor McCormick and Councilor Camardo second. Appointing a appointment resolution of 2014 appointing a member of the Board of Assessment Review. Whereas the provisions of the New York State Real Property Tax Law and City Charter require a municipality to appoint members of the Board of Assessment Review. And whereas the City of Auburn has constituted such a board and currently there is no there is currently there is one vacancy which has occurred as of October 1st, 2013. And whereas the city is conducting a re-evaluation of its current assessment and it is necessary that the vacancy be filled and it is recommended that Christopher D. Prospero, who is qualified to serve in such capacity, be appointed to the balance of the vacant term, which will commence upon the passage of this resolution and will expire on September 30th, 2018. Now therefore be it resolved that the Auburn Mayor and Council does hereby appoint Christopher D. Prospero, residing at 14 Aiken Drive, Auburn, New York, to become a member of the Auburn Board of Assessment Review, said term to commence upon the passage of this resolution and shall expire on September 30th, 2018. Discussion? Call the roll if you would, please. Councilor McCormick? Aye. Councilor Camardo? Yes. Councilor Cuddy? Yes. Councilor Rusica? Yes. Aye. Resolution number 34, requesting the service of the State Financial Restructuring Board for local governments, do we have a sponsor? Councilor Rizika, seconded by Councilor Camardo. <laughs> Council resolution number 34 of 2014, requesting the services of the State Financial Restructuring Board for local governments. Whereas local finance law Section 160.05, Section 3, created a financial restructuring board for local governments to provide assistance to eligible municipalities. And whereas the board may undertake a comprehensive review of the operations, finances, management practices, economic base, and other factors to make findings and recommendations on reforming and restructuring the operations of the fiscally eligible municipality. And whereas the purpose of the board is to provide expert assistance to local governments to improve financial conditions in fiscally stressed municipalities and may offer financial assistance in the form of grants and loans to implement recommended improvements. And whereas the city of Auburn continues to face serious financial challenges and could greatly benefit from a comprehensive review of its operations and finances by the financial restructuring board. And whereas in order to request a comprehensive review from the board, the governing board of a municipality must adopt a resolution asking the board to undertake such review. And whereas the Auburn City Council wishes to request a comprehensive review, now therefore be it resolved that the Auburn City Council does hereby request a comprehensive review by the Financial Restructuring Board for local governments and authorizes the mayor to file an application along with necessary documents and supporting materials. Councilor Cuddy. Mayor, I would like to table this uh, for the following reasons. Uh, I, I said I was wary about this last week and I just wanted to at least um, consider tabling it for a couple reasons. Uh, so far there's only been two uh, cities or municipalities that have, uh, that have applied for this and uh, Fishkill and Fulton are awaiting recommendations from the, uh, the, the financial restructuring board. I think it would be prudent to uh, see and hear what, um, what the recommendations might be made um, for those municipalities before we, before we um, go ahead and, and, and apply for this. So I'm, I'm not 
saying that we shouldn't do this, but I want to just give us some time uh, to see what that what that does. Also, um, you know, I'm concerned that what we, and it's actually a good thing, we don't meet one of the criteria for this uh, for this uh, this uh, opportunity because um, our general fund is above the the cut limit. So, I, so I don't want to. Um, be tempted to go below, <laughs> below um, our, 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 that limit to just to just to uh, to do this. So basically, um, you know, because this we're at the very early stages of this, um, I, I w still would like to humor or at least consider this um, at some point. But um, I'm very much just slightly concerned. I, I, I mean, I'm. I'm interested in tabling it until we hear what, until the financial um, restructuring board for local governments has, has given their say to Fishkill and Fulton. So I understand there's a, there's a council, there's a motion on the floor to table this to a later date. That's my. I, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but that's what you're saying. Yes, I'm, I okay. want to, for a later date, yes, okay. I want to table it. I'll second it. You're going to second? Okay. Because the motion to, to uh, table this, seconded. Please call the roll in regards to the tabling. Uh, motion to table Council Resolution Number 34 of 2014. <coughs> Councilor McCormick? Aye. Councilor Camardo? I'd like to have some discussion on it, and I'm going to vote no in, on this table, but I'd still like to have further discussion on it. <coughs> Councilor Cuddy? Yes. Councilor Rasika? No. Mayor Quill? Aye. Motion is tabled. Resolution Number 34 has been tabled. It's a good thing we got a lot of tables around here tonight, isn't there? Local laws. Table legislation done. Mr. Selby, under other business? Uh, yes. Two weeks ago, Council asked us to bring back a little more analysis on the potential transfer of codes to the fire department. Uh, I know Jenny and Chief Digert have been waiting patiently. Can I call you guys forward and uh, you can kind of walk through the meeting we had and the conclusions we reached. Thank you, Council, for having us tonight. Um, we had distributed by email yesterday to you, and um, we're at your desk today, hard copies, um, kind of a summary of the discussion uh, that we had with uh, the CSCA and the fire union last week. Um, we had staff from both departments there, the manager, corporation council, and the unions. Um, so we put in front of you four different scenarios that were kind of vetted and discussed. And Chief, please jump in anytime. But um, I'll, kind of, I'll kind of just go through, go through them one at a time. Um, the first one that we talked about was uh, firefighters being trained as code enforcement officers and assisting with the duties of the current code enforcement officers to help with the backlog of work. We've all we've been talking about that they are um, backlogged on their work. Our appointments are out quite a few weeks. Um, don't have the capacity to handle things all in the timely fashion that we would like to. Um, I do know that there's uh, CSCA represented here too, so if there's any questions for them, I definitely would defer um, to them as well. Um, CSCA representatives uh, talked about the work of code enforcement officers um, belonging to the union. Um, the CSCA, uh, if this was done, would charge uh, file charges under improper practices. This was done in the mid-1990s um, when this was pursued by the city at that time. At that time, an administrative law judge directed the city to reach an agreement, which was done. Um, and it was the understanding that if agreement had not been reached, the ALG would have found in favor of the CSCA. So in addition to what the union had said, um, the other concern, and we've continued to talk about the, the concern for our clerical staff in there, um, if we had additional code enforcement officers out there and bringing the work into the one clerical staff person, um, she's already over capacity, um, and it more even more illustrates the need to fill that keyboard specialist position, which is needed now even without more code enforcement officers. Fire union also, do you wanna talk about the fire union? Uh, well, the fire union, in the past, firefighters had received training to do code enforcement. 
Uh, that happened up until, uh, my dates might be slightly off, but roughly around 1998 when New York State got rid of its own New York State Building Code and went to basically the National Building Code. People weren't grandfathered in at that point. Uh, they had never been, the firefighters at that point had never been utilized fully as code enforcement officers, but as fire inspectors out in the field. At this point in time, to get any individual who has no prior training up to where they would need to be to be a, a fully certified code enforcement officer is an extensive amount of training, and there's a couple issues with that. First of all, uh, finding a location and the time. Uh, the New York State Code Enforcement Division, uh, due to budgetary constraints and things like that through time, they've been whittled away, and it's very difficult to fi actually find the classes that are A, nearby, B, convenient, and scheduled when you need them to uh, take place. So there's a time element as far as how timely it would be to, to get all those different classes in that you would need. There's a cost element in it also with, you know, how do we compensate these folks when they're out of town uh, because most of those classes are out of town and require hotel stays and things like that. So there's, there are several factors that, that play into that. Can I ask right a question before sure. we go back? Just one quick question. Why couldn't we do the training and bring somebody here as done in other municipalities? Again, there'd be a or cost. Another, there'd be well, a I cost. understand there'd be a cost, but you wouldn't have overnight stays and travel and all that stuff. Somebody would come here, conduct a, a two-day class or whatever to make sure everybody qualifies. Yeah, it's, again, it would be an extensive amount of time. Again, you're paying somebody to come in. There's, there's cost either way. One of the other things I remember that um, the, the other firefighters that were um, in the meeting, they were concerned. One, one of the things that we had talked about in our original document to you was if we did this, potential savings could be code enforcement overtime um, from not being called in overnight. Um, one of the things that they, the firefighters said was a concern is that if they were on a scene and they had a certified code enforcement officer, one of the firefighters with them, and they got a call out, they would have to leave that scene and surrender um, control of that property. Um, so right now how they do it is they have a code enforcement officer come in, do their inspection, and then they can leave on another call. So they were concerned because then that firefighter who was also a certified code enforcement officer has to be with his truck and he would have to leave and then they wouldn't be able to continue the inspection on the code enforcement side. So that was, that was a concern um, also that was mentioned as part of that. Any questions on that scenario? Okay, number two. Um, this is one of the ones where the first meeting that, that the chief and uh, Brian Hicks and I had had together thought might be a possibility because it doesn't require any further training for the firefighters. Um, complaints related to trash, grass, and snow, basically property maintenance complaints, um, are things that, you know, is the grass too high, is the trash in the yard, um, is the snow not shoveled. Um, so there's probably about seven calls a year like that, um, and those are on a complaint basis. So you know it takes us, you know, it takes us out pretty much every day to respond to those. Um, so that was something we thought could could um, could be done. So the idea would be that the firefighter would report the violation to code enforcement, and a certified code enforcement officer would write the violation. So as we talked to CSCA uh, related to that. Um, even though further training wouldn't be required for the firefighters, uh, the complaints related to property maintenance work would still be considered CSCA work. Um, so that would still be a concern, um, and um, it would be my understanding there would still be a filing related to that work. Um, in addition, the staff that was in the, in the meeting um, from code enforcement, Brian, was concerned about he or the other officers writing a violation that they had not personally inspected themselves. Um, the fire union, um, do you want to talk about that? Just some concern over public perception as far as, you know, if you've got a, a, a large truck out doing some of these, what could be perceived as, as minor details, uh, where currently a code enforcement officer is handling it in a small sedan. So just some public perception issues that may be out there. Any questions on that one? Okay, the third scenario basically is um, 
department head swap, um, just uh, code enforcement um, functions transferred from the planning office to the fire department. CSE employees uh, are continuing to do the duties of the code enforcement office. So basically they would report to the fire department instead of to the planning office. Um, both unions um, were agreeable to this scenario. Um, CSEA reps um, did make the comment that there basically were no cost savings um, for this particular scenario. Um, were, would there be any efficiencies gained? Um, not really. So that was, that was, that was um, the short discussion around that, but what that did was that generated discussion around um, a physical move to the fire department, and I know that there's been some interest from some counselors around that, so um, that was more of the discussion around this scenario. Um, as we've talked about before, um, there's concern about space for parking code enforcement vehicles, both their city vehicles and their personal vehicles in that area. Um, when the parking lot was redone around the firehouse, um, there were spaces lost. Um, to fire and police personnel. Um, there were, and you know, on the economic development side, it was good that we gave some spaces to businesses. We sold a parking lot to a business down there. But as far as available parking for city vehicles, um, we, we've lost that. Um, in addition, since code enforcement was down there in the 1990s, station two, the fire station two has closed. So there's more personnel and equipment um, at the main uh, station than there was back at that time. Uh, the office space they utilized at that time is no longer available, um, and in addition, it would take um, uh, some renovation in order to make that happen, to put the counter back in, office equipment, uh, things like that. Um, that has not been budgeted um, in either the fire department or code enforcement budget. Any questions on that scenario? Okay, so the fourth thing we talked about basically was um, better coordination um, and communication um, between the firefighters and code enforcement officers. As you know, firefighters are out on regular fire inspections and the new vacant building registry program has rolled out very successfully. Um, we're excited about that and uh, the fire department is doing an excellent job on that. So as the firefighters are out, um, what we talked about is um, basically, and we have done this in the past, um, it was specifically around leaf pickup. Um, but giving the firefighters door hangers to have in the trucks, if they see you know, grass that's high or trash or snow or something like that, just hang it on the doorknob. Hey, did you know um, that you, know, you need to cut your grass? Um, you know, please do so. And then that would be um, communicated to the code enforcement officer who could then go out and, and um, respond to, to that particular um, issue. So um, that seemed to be agreeable to um, the, the unions and the staff that were that were in the room. And uh, so that's what we would propose starting to do um, immediately. Um, in that scenario, the code enforcement office would continue to report um, to the planning office. And that's all we got. Council <laughs> McCorm. Thanks for regrouping and going over this again for well, at least for myself, but um, it was kind of everywhere since we just came into the saddle here. Mm -hmm. um, as I read through it, it looks like there's more, each, each scenario um, has either no savings or some expense or no efficiencies. It, it doesn't seem like many of them offer the things that you kind of would hope you would get after doing all this work. Um, the th I, I, I would go with um, n one through three, I think it is. Don't seem to, there's the one you just mentioned, but I don't think four. four. If that works, that seems to be a, um, a just common sense kind of a good idea, but the other ones don't seem to be work. The, the one that keeps jumping into my head, and I hate to sound like a broken record, but it's, I think the code office should be open five days a week. We could do that in a minute. And it would relieve a lot of, um, I think of the people that are coming in, no matter where you're located, it should be open five days a week. If we could get that done, that would be great. Um, as far as these, these things go, I, I don't favor any of them except for number four if that's what you're looking for from city council. Well, and I appreciate you mentioning, and, and you beat me to it. I was gonna be up here, so I was gonna take the opportunity to talk about that particular position, and I appreciate your support, and Council Camardo has been um, supportive of that um, from 
day one from the moment it got cut from the budget he was opposed to that so um, we definitely want to have the office open we believe that it would be um, better for revenues we believe that um, more work would be done with permits instead of out per without permits um, so you know we would love to see that our revenues are good um, you'll see that um, again in the budget reports that are coming out to you in your in your packets next week um, the the changes that the the council made to the permit fees um, have really uh, generated more revenue we've had some great commercial projects that have also generated a lot of revenue so the the positions already been more than paid for uh, with the revenues that have come in already this year that's great think of the ones that are out there that didn't pay for that came and the door was shut and they didn't pay for anything they were I know on Fridays people are frustrated they want to do something on the weekend no one is there I mean there's people but it's closed and they I've heard them say right in the hall I'm just gonna do it and go, you know that's not a good thing Councilor Rizika uh, I, I can understand the, the need for for uh, the, or the desire to staff that position however given the fact that we can't even uh, replace some police officers that are being retired here uh, concerns me more uh, I would to me if it was a choice between a police officer and a keyboard specialist I don't see any comparison here uh, as far as convenience yes it is inconvenient but also they know the hours are, are of operation are posted they they need to uh, adjust to the convenience or not I know they have to adjust to this inconvenience but the hours are posted when this uh, office is open uh, it requires a little bit more planning on, on the uh, uh, the homeowners or property owners part but I don't think it's an insurmountable thing uh, again like I say in regard to the the, the hiring of a, of a keyboard special I would much rather see us apply that towards another officer than than this, uh, especially in light of what just recently happened in the city. Councilor Camaro. Um, Mayor, I just, if we could, um, we just got this yesterday. I briefly read it over and thank you for spending the time on it um, and giving the presentation tonight. But I think it would, if we could have a week or so just to look everything Absolutely. over, get back to you with some questions that sure. I might have or the rest of council might have so we could further review it. Um, Let's not table another thing. No, I, I don't. I don't mean to be putting another thing off, but uh, I no, just no, I, I, I just think that um, you know this is going to be a major point that we need to look at. Unfortunately, with the financial situation we're in, we need to do more with less. That's what's mm -hmm. being faced every community. So we got to look at how we can make the best of of every situation and we'll make it work out for the best of the taxpayers of the community so if we could have just some have some time to look this over I'd appreciate it just let us know when you want us to come back Jenny your chief before you sit down and, and no, item number four is kind of, I'm, I'm leaning that way myself just for clarification and, and to me it's not a deal breaker does the code enforcement office stay under planning or is it go under fire or is that that's undetermined at this point. I mean, under that scenario, um, yeah, I mean, that's something we can implement immediately um, as it is right now under the planning office. Un remaining under the planning right. office. Okay. Right. right. So, I mean, even whichever way it goes, I mean, I think it's, I think it could be done. It, sh it should be done. It has been done. So. It's been, it's been back and forth and yep. back and forth. So. You, I, as yeah. you know, Mayor, I've lived through a couple different variations of this as, as you did also. Um, I think the current configuration with codes at City Hall works works best. We do have a parking situation on Market Street. If we were to take parking spots away, you'd be impacting businesses as well as uh, some uh, day hab facilities down there where there's handicapped people coming in and out. There's a lot of emergency traffic between the police and fire department in and out. It's not an ideal situation to increase the traffic, I think, is an issue. Um, there really isn't space down there. Uh, we, we lost the facility on Franklin Street several years ago, so that a lot of the material from that made its way into the building that's there now, the closure of the Frederick Street Fire Station. A lot of that material made its way into the fire station. So the days uh, from way back when, when the uh, code enforcement was run out of the fire department, 
it's a different animal down there now in terms of call volume for both the police and the fire department, the amount of emergency traffic going in and out, um, the day have facility that did not exist there at the time. So we've got handicap uh, accessible uh, vans and buses that come in and out of there, unloading and offloading, offloading un and loading um, the folks there. And the businesses have the, every building on that street now is occupied with some sort of a business where in the past it hadn't been. Um, I think some of the things that are moving forward right now, we should wait and see how some of those things play out. The new software system I think is going to help the code enforcement and the fire department be more a little bit more efficient or a lot more efficient and get caught up on some of these things on both sides and improve our communication with each other, which is essentially what we're looking to do. The vacant building registry has improved communication because we're having to work hand in hand on those things. So those things are improving without a major expenditure, without a major disruption. Chief, I wasn't advocating to move them out of here. I was just trying to get a clarification, the day-to-day -day supervision was whether it's gonna remain with, co with the, the planning or, or the fire. Uh, in 1995, that's when it first originally happened, and the biggest, <clears throat> excuse me, the biggest hang-up at the time was they would be receiving fees for permits and so forth, and it was a major problem around here because the money had to be transferred from the fire station to the treasurer's office every day, and that was a major concern, which we worked through very well eventually. So, uh, later days, later problem, bigger problem. So. But I, I, I just looking for clarification, the day-to-day -day supervision of, of the code enforcement officers. That's what I'm looking for. Is that agreeable, Council? Study on this for a couple of weeks and get sure. back to the man. It would probably be great timing also because I would imagine not too many weeks we'll have planning and the fire department here for uh, budget review. So uh, right. probably be a good part of that. Yeah, so any decision on this would definitely impact mm -hmm. how we um, prepare our budgets. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Council, your turn. Other business? I'll go first. Mm -hmm. Please. Um, Doug, just a reminder, I know we got this information yesterday, but if we could get this information at, at least a week in advance um, before presentations are made here at Council so we have proper review time. Um, the second thing is um, the, re the State Financial Review Board. Doug, could you, this was your recommendation, I believe, correct? Uh, I brought it forward for council and it seemed like there was an interest in What's considering it. Let, let me ask you a question if I can. Sure. What do you think about it? I think an independent look at how we operate and manage would be good. Um, so it's something. Whether it's this mechanism or something else or we, we do a good careful self-analysis. I feel the same way, and I think that um, it's going to take a while for us to get on a waiting list, isn't it? going to take some time for us. There's a waiting list now. I understand the resources are limited. Uh, there are two communities, as Councillor Cuddy mentioned, that are in the program now in the very early parts of it. The City of Rochester has applied. Um, so the recommendations that they will make are, are, it's up to us to implement any of those recommendations, I would assume. Unless you take money from them, yes. So. I would, uh, I would strongly say that we move forward. Um, we have city staff that's recommending this so that, uh, you know, I want to make sure that we follow through on a recommendation that the managers are bringing forth. Um, second thing I have to talk about just quickly, Franklin Street. I went down there through there again. Are we making any, how are we making out with trying to get that street? Some way it's stabilized so it's not so bumpy. And the area has already been yes. reconstructed. I was going to the college yesterday and it was difficult to get down through there. Yeah. I know it's a hard, but is the contractor aware of what's going on? Are oh, we? Yeah. Yes. I don't know if I see Mr. Lupian in the back. So you want to come forward, Bill? And Our resident engineer was in the audience last week when you mentioned it up, and he's had uh, uh, Rizzo Construction out there. They were out there again today, out there yesterday. They've gone from one end of the job to the other, trying to fill in all the holes and all the rest, but it is that time of year when that stuff just keeps kicking right out, and they'll just 
every day go very right back there and try to fill in the holes if as you, best as they can. Have you driven that street, Bill? Yes, I have. When, just recently? Yes, I have. Because I was there last night and it, it, it was in rough shape. Right. And, and, and they had worked on it during the day and it's just, you know, sometimes, you know, um, before when I ran public works for about five years, sometimes I had crews out there three, day, three shifts a day, seven days a week, filling out potholes on Grand Ave. It just, it, it's, if you don't have hot material, you can't keep the stuff in the, in those potholes. And uh, the cold patch just doesn't work when we're in this big gravel trenches like this. Um, we, if we put the concrete in with all those freeze thaw, that would have popped up and we would have big chunks flying all over. I mean, they're, they're doing the best they can. They're out there every day and every night that stuff's gonna kick out and the next day they'll be right back there again trying to fill in those holes. We'll be as diligent as we can and we'll make sure they stay on top of it. Uh, but it's, it's a fact of life until that hot, those hot plants open up, we're just gonna be chasing our tail here for a little bit, uh, but we'll do the best job we can. And the, and the big thing is, is to make sure they're out there every day. Right. And we'll keep on that, yeah, okay? okay? Thank you. Um, Doug, as you know, the other day I called you about a hydrant that was open on Grand Avenue, and it was beyond the sidewalk. The water was running down the sidewalk and across the street. Then at night it got into a situation where it was it made the street slippery. Talk to Tom G Gayback uh, just as we came in tonight, and I was wondering if there was a way of trying to get a hose on some of those hydrants so that they could put the water right into the road and hopefully into a catch basin. He talked to the chief about getting some old fire um, hoses to hook up so that they could direct that water into the hydrant so if, or into the catch basin. So if that's something we could follow up on, I'll, I'll make sure that's, that's that. um, yeah. being, being looked into. Appreciate both of them for taking the time. Um, next thing was, I see you're advertising for um, a senior planner in the paper this past week. Yes. And you said that because we're getting behind in some, some work in the planning department. Yes. And also because they need to take minutes at some of the meetings, you're gonna, you'd are gonna you have a senior planner take minutes at meetings? No. No, but my point was the combination of everything that's going on in the planning department, that that position is needed to basically do the work that needs to be done. And there's a lot more activity uh, because of the development activity that's coming in front of planning. How about if we make a, uh, have this looked at maybe next week and look at maybe a senior clerk and we could put that person in part-time planning in, and part-time code, code to code the enforcement? senior planner? No, I'm talking about we're in a financial problem right now trying to save some money and maybe hire um, a senior clerk and put them part-time in the planning office and part-time in code enforcement so that we could try to cover two offices and save some money instead of hiring a senior planner. If that's possible, could we have some discussion on that? I hate to have us go through a budget situation again where somebody's gonna maybe lose a job because of the financial problems that we're having and in this area, as I said before, hang on one second, Councilor. In this, this, this instance, as I said before, we need to be doing more because we don't have it. We, we need to be doing more or less, unfortunately. I, I see Jenny would like to address the council. Please, please, Jenny. Yes, um, th this senior planner um, position um, is in the budget. Um, this has been vacant since last May um, when uh, our program manager um, took another position. Um, if you remember during the budget process, I reduced it to a senior planner position in order to save money. This position is the lead staff to the planning board. We do not have the physical planning training um, that's needed. The rest of the staff doesn't have it and a senior clerk wouldn't have it. So we need this person in order to staff the planning board. Currently, right now, I am gaining that expertise through consulting for services. And uh, so I'd like to get a staff person in place um, in order to have a long-term solution to that issue. The planning board is a, is a core service of our office. And um, we have right now, um, we, we're having four and five different projects um, on our agendas right now. Uh, well, so we really need this expertise. If we got you some clerical staff to relieve some of the, the seniors, you know, the senior planners um, workload, maybe it could help out save some money. I'd love you to, my part-time assistant is part-time. I'd love to have her full-time at the moment. Well, I would be talking about a part-time position in your department and in codes. I, so that they would share both areas. I love more clerical staff all day long, but I need the professional expertise in this position. We don't have it. Well, unfortunately, we got to look at our finances also, and we're going to have to make some tough decisions come, come budget time. 
I understand, McCormick. Councillor. Thank you. Hang on, uh, hang on a minute. Uh, I think Councillor McCormick. Okay, I'm please. sorry. Oh well, all I wanted to to add was that um, maybe oh. this. I think they need the planner. Absolutely need the planner. But if I, I understand what Councillor Camardo is saying, maybe there's a way to shift things uh, among other staff. But that I think is something either it's addressed in the budget or it's a personnel thing. I don't think we. Well, that's what I was asking Doug yeah. to look into it if he would, so that. Yeah, but maybe I, we could see some <coughs> somewhere somewhere but we ask of planning all the time for they really are the heart and soul of where we get things done and planned for and followed up on and I really think they're it's it's gonna our the city's overall the work we do is gonna suffer it's like the hub of everything and just a reminder um, we were at eight and now we're at 5.5 we're already doing more with less that 5.5 is this position it's including that. Position. It's including, it's including that position. Including that, okay. Yes. You've been at four and a half for a little, almost a yep, year. Yep, because the position's been vacant. We're okay, struggling. Good. Yes, I, I agree with Councilor McCormick. Um, I, I consider the planning department the, uh, the engine, if you will, to, to, for grant writing, to, to provide us with the opportunities uh, for the city to grow. Um, you know, I really think that, that um, it's a very important position because that is where um, the vision for this community comes from. And, and now more than ever, we need vision, we need uh, somebody that is qualified and uh, can work with the current planning staff to really uh, problem solve to get us out of some of these financial, uh, financial issues. And I really b believe that, that uh, if you want to get out of a financial, um, you know, quagmire, you have to invest. Uh, you have to think long term. You have to. Um, I, I, I guess it's just a difference in approach uh, towards uh, towards a financial recovery. But I, I really think the uh, a senior planner is crucial, and 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 I I've uh, felt that way um, prior to uh, being elected into office. And I, um, being in office, I even feel more strongly that that position needs to be filled. Councilor Rizika. I, I, again, we have all these wants, uh, maybe some needs, but the bottom line is how are we gonna pay for it? I mean, we have to look at this as a, in, the, in light of the situation. I mean, we, we had recommendations from our uh, auditing committee and they came out and very specifically with some very solid recommendations. And, and I think they wouldn't have given us those recommendations on their professional opinion if they didn't feel that they were warranted and necessary. Um, this is an unusual situation where, yes, it's desirable. We may want it, but we have to weigh in our, our wants and it may be an approach approach situation, but we have to decide what we want more. Um, so that being said, I mean, we really need to be cautious about adding additional people. Uh, again, like I say, we're, we're having a short shortage in the, in the police department because of retirements and uh, there's gonna be positions held vacant there because of the financial situation. Again, I see a bigger need or bigger want in the police department at this point in time, especially, like I say, again, in reference to just what recently happened. We need to understand what we want and then we have to prioritize our wants. I, I mean, we, it'd be great if we could hire everybody that we need, and, but ultimately, how are we gonna pay for it? This is, but this would be part of the plan. I mean, if you think it through, you have a planner that's, that you hire to help bring money into the city, to come up with ideas, to expand our tax base, to bring business into the community, then uh, this, the, the city grows. And as the city grows, you increase the tax base, you can hire more uh, firefighters, more police officers, more typists, more planners. The idea, the way I look at it is that I, wa I wanna think f further than this, Budget cycle as, as important as this budget cycle is very is is, is important. Um, you know, it's not. It, it, we need to think about the city's future, and and the way to really 
uh, build the city is not by cutting positions and not filling crucial positions like a, a senior planner. You, you misunderstood my point. I said we have to balance our wants with what makes sense. But like I say, we have some significant issues here uh, in public safety. Again, I have to refer to a recent incident. A lot of people determine to make a determination of, of where they live based on what's in public safety, what's in fire, what's in police, and, and the community. Uh, if people don't feel that they're safe in their community, you're not gonna attract them. Part of these things are school districts. I mean, the school districts are another big portion of this. If we, if we, we need to, like I say, we need to fully understand all the wants and we have to prioritize and we have to decide what we want more. And we have to be very cautious because ultimately we got to decide how we're, this is all going to be paid for. We need to have that balance. We need to have that understanding. And, it's, and that's something that's got to be done at the budget cycle. It has to be done with public input. They have to decide what they would like us and provide us with some direction as to what they really would like to see. I'm sure everybody has their list of, of, of desirabilities and wants, but again, it's our job to take these and prioritize them because we gotta figure out how it's gonna be paid for. Mr. Selby, uh, I'm the deciding vote that this isn't a vote. Uh, I wanna move forward hiring sure. senior, hire the senior planner. It's, it's in the budget, it's a budgeted position. I, I feel all aspects of the city are important. Police, fire, water, trash removal, planning, everyone is important. Everyone has a key role and we all have to work together to, to encourage growth for our community and make it a great place to live. So I would say move forward with the hiring, please. Okay. Councilor, you had the floor originally. Yeah, I'm not. You had enough? <laughs> no, just one more thing if okay. I could. And you sit on CETA and um, I know that uh, they had recent uh, discussions this past week about Combining seat, I guess, with the with the chamber is that is that what one of the decisions or decisions that were made? I was wondering if I know six months ago or eight months ago we had um, some talks with the county and CETA in regard to some of the economic development areas that we want to move in, and I was wondering if we could do that in the future, a very near future, if possible. Um, I guess Mike, and you and Doug both sit on that committee, is that right? So that maybe we could set up a meeting where they they could come in and address council on some of the areas that were. Looking at moving forward and okay, yeah, possible. Sure, sure. We thank you. Here. That's all I had. Thank you, <laughs> Councilor Zika. Uh, Doug, I, I got hit one more uh, uh, a point. Um, someone had brought up to my attention that uh, an individual in the clerk's office was given either a, a raise or a stipend. Uh, it wasn't clear to me. Uh, do you provide me any insight on what happened there? Yeah, the, the city has a position that's required, I think, under state law called a Registrar of Vital Records. Mm -hmm. Instead of hiring a position, uh, we reached an agreement with the union to pay a stipend to an individual. So it's a money savings measure. Okay. I, I, it was just brought up to my attention, and I, I said I didn't have any clue because they asked me about it. That's all. Yeah, it's, uh, it's a required position, and... And what's, what's the position, once again? Registrar for vital records. Isn't that a clerk's job? Uh, no, I guess under state law it's a specific, isn't it, John, specific That's title? The public health law requires that the city uh, appoint, the mayor appoints a, a uh, registrar. <clears throat> and that position has been held uh, in the past. Um, Councilor McCormick held that position after Joseph. the uh, prior registrar left service and that has always been uh, uh, in agreement uh, with the union. It doesn't create a new position, it's just a position we have to uh, uh, fund uh, and uh, it's the official person who signs the death certificates mm -hmm. and all the other certificates right. that we have. We have to designate someone. It was We eliminated a full-time position back in whenever. 2000 when that person retired so we were cutting okay. before it was in vogue yeah what well, it counts there was nothing new it was something that's been carried on and it had to be appointed uh, per state law so. well I, I understand but the way, way you know they asked me about it I, said, I have no clue <laughs> no, I, I, no I, I would ask the same question yeah. so. 
Anyone else? Oh, yeah. Councilor. Oh, yes. Um, first, I want to remind the public and council that um, on March 1st at the college, the um, State of the Lake will be held. It'll be March 1st. It's um, a sim like a symposium or a talk on, um, you know, I'm gonna, it's, I think it's in the morning. <laughs> I got their website, it doesn't say. Um, I think it's 9 to 11. 9 to noon. 9 to noon, no. okay. Thanks, Terry. <laughs> Thanks, Councilor Cuddy. That's um, it's a really, it, uh, I've sat through part of this. It's the state of the Wasco Lake. It's the, how the state of the lake will impact our public water supply and recreation. And then uh, another talk on the invas invasive species that are in the lake. And it impacts everything, including the pumping station. Um, so we've got to pay attention to it. And um, I was going to ask the manager if, if next week when we bring back the um, bond ordinance, if um, Christina maybe, if, if some, whoever's like the person behind the writing the grant and knows the, how these things all, the deadlines and all that, if she could, if possible, be here? It would she could? Christina. Oh, great. Yeah. Thank you. And the water department, um, council, or Tom Gayback spoke earlier, and I, I, it just so happened I was invited by the water department uh, about a month ago to do my new city councilor tour, and I think Councilor Cuddy did it in December. The day I went, I, I apologized and I offered to come back another day, but they said, no, this is a good day to be here. I thought it was like a triage in an emergency room. It was a day when the calls were coming in, the, the breaking water lines, and it was a very hectic. And, and But nobody was complaining about it. They were just too busy to do that. They were just very busy, and it, it's a serious problem. And um, it, it just it, it highlighted to me how critical the stage uh, state of our our water infrastructure is and another just another um, doesn't fall into s any specific city business but I was um, told by someone that watches our council meetings that um, I, I don't hear everything I don't know if you hear everything but our microphones carry to the the video projector and the c things that are said under our breath can be heard at home. So I just thought I'd make that, that um, make people aware of that so that if you have any comments that you might not want to make them public, you might want to back away from that microphone. So I don't think anybody here did that. That might have happened at another council meeting, but that's all I have. Thank you. Anyone else? I'll go last, and I, I have two items. Doug, uh, we had, uh, we met with the county chair, uh, Mike Chapman and Susan Sinclair, mm -hmm. the radio come up again. Where do we stand? What What is necessary from council to move that forward? And the reason I'm asking, and, and I'm interrupting you, but if, if we could move that forward, that may form a little better relationship when we have our joint meeting, so. Um, it may involve a request for the council to move some funds okay. around. I, I can look into that if you're interested. I'd like to see that back in a couple okay. of weeks if we could. Okay. Let's, we owe the money. Mayor, can I just ask a question? Let me, let me finish, please, Councilor. regard to that. Uh, we owe the money. Let's, let's get this done. So, Councilor. I was going to make a, a proposal to the members of the legislature if it was okay with the council, and I'll bring that next week. On a proposal of bringing um, of trying to take that forty or four hundred thousand dollars that we owe and try to stretch it over ten years, they are making bond uh, payments over thirty years. I believe they bonded out, and I was going to come to council next week and ask if, with your permission, that we could bring this forward to the legislature and ask if we could try to move that four hundred thousand dollars over as many years as possible that we would owe the county just to help us out with our financial position that it doesn't come out of fund balance. So. I would like to be able to talk about that next week, if possible. Doug, I, I believe we did. We mention a little bit about that, or you know, yes, but, yeah. So, uh, and what was it? At least the chairman didn't think it was a good idea. Well, I, I, I think some legislators would be open to the to the discussion. That's why I think it would be a good idea to have it have the discussion on what March 16th. You said uh, 26th. 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 I, I'd like a. 
Go ahead, please. If, if possible, that we can make that presentation because we're going to need some. I just hate to see us draw down the fund balance any more than we have to. I, and I agree, but at the same time, we're on the hook for the money, and we owe them. And it, and it was a uh, it was a good faith negotiation on both sides. So I would like us to move forward with that. So, without making a presentation to the full legislature first, or uh, how about if we ask Mr. Selby to talk with uh, uh, Suzanne Sinclair and, and Mr. Chapman? That'd be agreeable sure, to you. Absolutely. Okay. Lastly, uh, for the Democrat members of council, there will be a caucus next Thursday at 5 p.m. in the executive chamber. So, uh, the other two gentlemen who are not Democrats, you're more than willing to sign your name on the line and join the caucus if you like. But uh, I asked Councilor Smith that years ago, and I still haven't received a response. So, but uh, we will be holding a caucus. I haven't been involved in the caucus as of yet, and I don't want to. I would. Thank you. It was more than just a caucus, <laughs> Councilor. <laughs> Councilor Rizika. Um, this may be more under the recap, but Doug, where's the status of all the recap items? Where's the uh, recap or the recap? Recap again or the recap? Uh, since uh, our new clerk has been keeping such detailed notes, that it, it's I've been looking at those in there within there, within that. So I think I just need to extract them and, and bring them forward. Uh, the, looking back at last week, the, the main item I had was a uh, request for council, from Councilor Camardo about the sediment from Hoops Park, and we're looking into that. We think it might be possible to move that to the Dunham-McCarthy site. So, um, I don't, Jenny, do you have any new information yet? Um, at, at one point, as you know, we had been asked by EPA, who had funded the um, phase one and phase two, not to put any more material on the site. Um, phase two is complete, um, so we were working with a con uh, conversation between EPA and DEC um, to see if it was agreeable for us to put any more material on the site. So we're waiting for a conversation with DEC. Okay? Thank you. As long as we're talking about recaps, maybe we have to recap. <laughs> I don't have a recap. You don't have a recap. <laughs> right. okay, I got a list. All that, the big buildup. I got a list of about 100 things here, but not a recap. Okay. Yeah. Is there some way that, we, you know, we're getting our, we're receiving our packets through the email now, or through, uh, you know, yeah, through email, basically. Is there some way we can start capturing these recap items and just have them tagged right into it? I know Councilor Bazika has been asking this. He was a young man when he started asking for this. and uh, My hair wasn't, wasn't gray. Well, we won't go that far, but you were a younger man, so. But, uh, you know, if, if there was some way between the two offices, we could do that. Okay. That would, that would, and then just an answer. Once, once it's, in my mind, once it's responded to, then it comes off and, yeah. and we move on to the next one, so. And I know it's time consuming and we're all short staffed, but uh, it'd be some way to think about it. Okay. Do we have a request for executive session? Uh, yes, I do, Your Honor. I have two items under the uh, possibility of uh, land sales and uh, uh, the second item is an appointment of personnel to be discussed All right and I have a request to consider a collective bargaining issue this time I attain a motion for executive session Councilor McCormick seconded by Councilor Camardo mm -hmm. clerk of your call a roll please for executive session sure Motion to enter into executive session, Councilor McCormick. Aye. Councilor Camardo. Yes. Councilor Cuddy. Yes. Councilor Rusica. Yes. Mayor Quill. Aye. Be in recess for executive session.